This week, uh, we're, we're picking up again in this series that we're entitling More Than Acquaintances. We're looking at a relationship with Jesus Christ, how you end up in a position where you are his disciple, not merely somebody who has heard about him or knows about him. It's a matter of historic fact that Jesus was a divisive personality in his day. Isn't that true? There were many people who loved him, and there were many, many more people who hated him. And that's true today. There are many people who love Jesus. There are many people who hate Jesus. If you doubt that for even a moment, let me just challenge you with this. I want you to just go into any crowd uh, of a gathering where you have some Christians and some not Christians, and then just say, hey, what do you think about that Jewish carpenter? How about that guy? What do you think of Jesus? And see how they respond. For some people, it is like a threat. It, it's, it's, it's even bringing up the name immediately makes them uncomfortable. Maybe some of you in this room are feeling that even now, right? A little discomfort from even hearing the name of Jesus. For other people, it is the greatest comfort in the world to hear that name. I know who Jesus is to me. I know what he means to me. They love him or they hate him. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever sought out a reason to hate Jesus? I know that's why you all came to church this morning. You're looking for a reason to hate Jesus. I'm not suggesting you actually hate Jesus, but as a mental exercise, as a, as a cognitive adventure, have you ever gone through the process of thinking, what's a good reason to disdain this man? Most people who are non-believers have engaged in that exercise to some degree or another. They've sought out that reason. What can I use as a means to disregard this guy, to disdain him, to hate Jesus? So how about it? What about Jesus' character? What about Jesus' teachings would cause you to hate him, to disdain him? You might be saying, does anybody really hate Jesus? I mean, like he's like Mr. Rogers, right? Doesn't everybody love Jesus? And the answer to that is no. You don't crucify Mr. Rogers, right? That sounds like a threat. You don't crucify Mr. Rogers. Good t-shirt idea, by the way, for anybody who wants to leave today. The thing is, is people definitely did hate Jesus. Many wished to kill him uh, as he walked around on this earth. I mean, how many of you uh, as infants experienced a king setting out to destroy your life? Like, Jesus was in that position. From the time he was born, people hated him enough to destroy him. And that didn't end throughout the whole course of his ministry. That also is part of the what we are recipients of as Christ followers is the hatred of a lot of people. It's, it's true. Jesus understood this fact. John chapter 15, verse 18, Jesus said this to his followers. Understand, uh, if the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. If the world hates you, you got to know it hated me first. So what reason is there to hate Jesus? I want to suggest to you one reason, and we're going to deal with it through the whole course of today's message. If you've ever looked for a reason to hate Jesus, you're getting one at church today. Here it is. You ready? Jesus requires something difficult of you. That's it. If you want an, a, a reason to disdain Jesus, Jesus is requiring you to do something difficult with your life. But it's a hassle, and I don't want to do it. Now, that might seem like a petty reason to hate someone. Does it, doesn't it sound like a petty reason to hate someone? Is it a sufficient reason to hate someone? Think about how people feel or talk about their bosses. Think about how people feel or talk about their teachers at school, Right? Sometimes all that is necessary in order to really disdain someone is for them to impose something upon your set of desires. Instead of doing what you want, I'm going to call you to do this. And for many, that is sufficient reason to hate Jesus. They can set it aside. As silly as it sounds, many people hate Jesus simply because he offers them inconvenience. I want you to imagine Jesus' ministry a little differently. Let's imagine that instead of Jesus making moral claims on you, instead of Jesus giving you directives, imagine Jesus ends every one of his sermons this way. But you know, whatever is cool for you, man, that's what I want you to do. How different would his ministry have been? It would have been, it would have been like he was saying nothing. His statements would be completely spiritually benign. There's no meat to them. He wouldn't have done anything. He wouldn't change the world, but he would have left everyone with just a bland taste in their mouth and said, I don't need to hate this guy. But that's not how Jesus' ministry operated. Jesus called us to legitimate life change. Last week as we got together, we talked about repentance throughout the entire message. 
metanoia, change your mind, change the way you think. And we said, you will never come into real relationship with Jesus until you repent, until you come to that place where you say, Jesus, you know more than I do. You know more than I do about my life, and I'm willing to change for you. Today, we're going to take it a step further. Today, I'm calling you out of the chairs in church, and I'm doing what Jesus did by calling you to a difficult life. This is what Jesus promised you. He said, count the cost, get ready, because you're going to endure a life that is, that is difficult. Uh, we'll give you the opportunity to hate Jesus today, but I'll also probably re resolve that issue. So if you want to keep hating Jesus today, leave after point one. Uh, if, you, if your desire is not to hate Jesus, just hang out. We'll, we'll see what else happens. Today we're focusing on the word mission. It's not enough to just know him. It's not enough to just show up. If you're banking on the fact that you came to church today for your salvation, sorry to disappoint you. Jesus has called you to more than just putting your backside in a chair. Let's go to our master in prayer, and then we will dig into today's message. Our Lord, help that word to just set in for a moment, Lord. You rule. You have reign. Uh, your command is law in my life. God, I pray for every one of us as we approach you as Lord. I pray that you will remind us of what we're saying. This week, as we hear from your word, and as we discuss this particular topic that I know has a lot of difficult application, God, I'm just asking your Holy Spirit will again speak to the inner man, cause us to change, to repent, renew our minds, and then also renew our actions that we might serve you better in this life. We love you, Lord Jesus, and we see clearly that you love us. It's in your most precious name we pray, O Lord. Amen. We're going to start today by engaging it with this weird teaching of Jesus where he calls people to count the cost. Count the cost. And it is a weird teaching. If you've been in the church for a while, you might be thinking, that's not a weird teaching. Yes, it is. You're just used to it. If you're not involved in the church, I think you should see before all said and done that this is a bizarre teaching. Count the cost. Secondarily, we want to look at reasons that Jesus is calling us to a difficult life, why it, it might win our affections as opposed to our animosity. And lastly, we're going to talk about your mission, your difficult role in this life. And I want this to get very personal before all said and done. With that said, let's talk about counting the cost. Have you ever had a vacuum cleaner salesman show up at your door? Okay, now I, I know from you know, TV in the 50s and 60s and 70s that there was such a thing as a vacuum salesman. But before Lisa and I moved to Mainville, we lived in Loveland. And one Saturday morning, the doorbell rang, which was strange, and I went and opened the door, and there's a man standing there with a vacuum. And I'm like, oh, I've heard about this. <laughs> I didn't know people still did this. I didn't know vacuums were sold door to door. And he said to me, he's like, look, I gotta, I gotta do a demonstration for at least five people before I can go home today. Can I come in and just do a demonstration in your house? And I'm like, yeah, come on in, let's see it. And my wife was like, oh, and so she just left. Uh, but I was like, let's do this, let's do this. Show me, show me your vacuum cleaner. And so uh, this guy came in, he said, I want you to get your vacuum cleaner out first. And what I'd like you to do is uh, take an area of your floor and I want you to start vacuuming it and vacuum it until you think it's clean. I'm like, okay, cool. So I'm vacuuming it. He's like, you sure that's clean? I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's clean. He's like, why don't you do it for another minute or so? And so I keep doing it. And he's like, okay, we're clean now? I'm like, yeah, I think we're clean now. And he goes, let's see. Oh, it's a good sales pitch. And then he takes his vacuum cleaner and he hits the same area. And then he shows me what he pulled out of my rug. And I'm like, no, oh, my vacuum cleaner's terrible. Right? Uh, and so, so I'm like sold on this vacuum cleaner immediately. I'm like, this is cool. I love this vacuum cleaner. And... Uh, so he, he, had, he had the sale basically ready to go until I heard the price tag. They wanted $2,000 for this vacuum cleaner. $2,000. And, and so I looked at him and I just laughed because I'm a fairly honest person. And I said, you have got to be kidding me. There's no way I'm spending $2,000 on a vacuum cleaner. And he's like, but you see what this vacuum cleaner can, it can do. Your drapes, it can do everything. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I, it may as well be a million dollars for me. I'm a newlywed. My wife's only working part-time right now. We don't have that kind of money. And he's like, but like, can't you th think about how this cleanliness is going to change your life? And so he's doing the whole pitch. And I'm just like, no, absolutely not. Well, he realizes this is not a sale at this stage. So he leaves. And you know what happens next, right? Comes back in. Listen, so there's this expired coupon. And I, I talked to my boss and we, we're going to apply that to this vacuum cleaner so that you can buy this. I've, I've gotten that price down, I think it was $1,400 or $1,600. I'm like, <laughs> no. 
I, you know, we have not died from using our vacuum cleaner yet. Uh, I, I think I'm just gonna keep pressing my luck. And so it, it just went on and on. And he kept reducing the price and reducing the price and just a little bit less, a little bit less. Finally, he's like, let me call my boss. And you know, you know when they do that, that's total sales tactic, right? Go, go ahead, call your boss. So he goes out and he comes back in and he's like, listen, my boss says we can give you this vacuum cleaner just for you. Because we know your family that is, is in, in a dire strait and in a situation where you can't afford this. But I, I really feel for you. So, so what we're going to do is today, I'm going to give you this vacuum cleaner for 600 bucks. Now at this stage of the game, I, I'm just ticked. Because I look at him and I go, look, dude, and I was honest. What you're telling me is you were about to charge me $1,400 more for this vacuum cleaner than you could have sold it to me for. Isn't that what you're saying? It's like, no, 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 we got special. No, we didn't get special permissions. And so I'm like, the fact that you were going to upsell it that much on me says that I probably don't want this vacuum cleaner anyway. So thank you. Good day. Oh, but sir, no, sorry. Off you go. Now, you've all had sales pitches probably come at you, right? where they overpromise and underdeliver, or they give you a price at the outset. Jesus gives us a cost at the outset to following him. It's way more than $2,000. When Jesus calls us to follow him, he essentially tells everyone, it will cost you everything. The whole of your life, everything that you have, everything that you are is what I want in order for you to follow me. And there is no reduction. There's no, let me call the manager. Jesus sets it out out front it's a terrible sales tactic. Is Jesus a terrible salesman? Let me ask you this question. What first drew you to Jesus Christ? What is it about Jesus that caused you to go, I need this. I need him in my life. Was it some benefit you thought you might gain? I need, I need my marriage fixed. Or maybe you're looking at life and you're like, man, my finances are out of control and I'm just, I'm a mess. Was it to get out of hell? I need fire insurance. I need to know that I'm not going to hell. Was it to uh, help you confront death or suffering in life? I just need, I need that in my life. Was it to make you a better person? Kind of like an exercise routine for your life where you're like, I'll take care of my physical body and I also need to take care of my spiritual frame so I'm going to start going to church. Was it help with anxiety? Was it to improve you as a person? What was it that drew you to Jesus? Maybe it wasn't some benefit you thought you might gain. Maybe it was pragmatism. Maybe you just went, hey, it seems like this life works for a lot of people. Maybe I should just try it for that reason. Or maybe you were just compelled by the truth. Maybe you began researching and studying and you thought, man, Christianity is a completely different message than any other worldview or world religion system that's out there. There's something to this. Maybe it's the case that you've just, you're brought up in it. And so for you, it is sort of a comfort thing that you keep returning to. Why do you follow Jesus? Let me ask you this. Did any of you lock into the person of Jesus Christ because you're like, I need something difficult to do? Generally, that's not the case for almost anyone. Very few of us ever come to Jesus and go, I'm looking for a hassle. I'm looking for a cost. I'm looking to deny myself. I'm looking to elevate him. I'm looking to set others before myself. I want to love my enemies. I am looking for a life that is totally different and alien from what the rest of this world is doing. And yet, that seems to be what Jesus is selling. It's a difficult plan for your life. When, whenever you think about coming to the Lord, what is the pitch that most Christians use? God's got a wonderful plan for your life. That's true. But it would be more accurate to say, God has a really difficult plan for your life, and when you pursue it, you're going to find that it's wonderful. How does Jesus make your life difficult? Well, there are things we don't do. There are things that we can't do as Christians. There are things that we do do. He just said do do. <laughs> There are times when you are required to be bold and brave. There are times when you are required to play by different rules. You must set yourself aside. There are inconvenient tasks. There's toil that you were supposed to be about. And that sounds really challenging, and that's exactly why many people don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. When it comes to Jesus' call for followers, here's what he essentially is, is saying. Follow me and get ready to feel it. Follow me and get ready to feel it. This is going to be a challenge for your life. Now, generally, we don't want a hassle in life, and I'll, 
I'll confess, there are moments in life that I look at and go, why am I doing this? I hate this, uh, particularly laundry. Uh, my wife uh, is, is a school teacher, and so, you know, depending on where we are in the year, sometimes I'll take the, the laundry duties. I, by, by the way, I've known guys who intentionally sabotage their laundry so that their wives are like, you are not allowed to do the laundry. Everything's pink. Oops. I'm not, I'm not that kind of guy. I, I will still do the laundry. Uh, but uh, here's, here's what I hate about the laundry. Firstly, identifying what category my wife's clothes fit into. Women's clothes are so confusing. Like, guys, like, Pants, shirt, shorts, socks, underwear. With women, it's like, what is this? What am I looking at? And inevitably, I always do it wrong. And she's like, where did you put that? I don't know. <laughs> Depends on what I thought it was that day. Uh, the second thing I really hate is doing socks. Man, I hate socks. It's, it's like somebody's forcing you to play the matching game, you know? <laughs> I don't want to do this. And so for me, that's just this, this trivial thing. I, at one point in time, and if you've never done this, by the way, I encourage you to do this. I took all of my children's socks and I threw them away. And I bought them new socks that all match one another. So all I have to do is find two and put them together. <laughs> that's what a strategist does. Laundry is a hassle, and there are a lot of times you look at the life following Jesus Christ, and you're like, why are we doing this? Why do we have to do it this way? And there are times you don't understand why you're doing it, but it's like laundry. You've got to be dressed. I mean, you've got to have these things done. And so in a sense, Jesus is prescribing a whole lot of these features for life, and I feel like many of us would just like to set them aside out of hand because they are simply that, their toil, their difficulty. Some of us, though, really do like an honest challenge. Uh, I asked this the first service. I'm not going to ask it the second service because of the way this went. <laughs> I have always wanted to have gone into the military. All right? uh, now, some of you have been in the military like, no, you don't. Um, there's part of me that always went, man, I really wish I'd, I'd signed up. Man, I really wish I'd, I'd done it. Uh, because there's part of me that just, I'm drawn to the camaraderie of a task. I'm drawn to the, the danger and the, the, the adventure and the travel. And, and many of you are in the military. It's like, it's not adventure. It's a lot of hard work. Yes. Yeah, there's tons of hard work and labor. And it probably feels like you're about something important. Uh, particularly for, for many of us, there is an appeal to something like that. The idea that the world could be fraught with difficulty and danger, hard, to put it in, in fantasy fiction terms, a quest. Don't you want a quest? Isn't there part of you inside that thinks, why am I just living to be safe and comfortable? Isn't there part of you that says, there's got to be something more, something that's meaningful and filled with purpose? For many of us, when we are given the gauntlet, when Jesus throws it down and says, here's the hard life, take it up. For, the, for many of us, there is a sense in which we go, I want that. I want my life to be difficult in the right ways. Maybe that's not you, but hopefully it will be before all is said and done today. Was Jesus... A good salesman? No. You're like, is that sacrilegious? No, it's okay to say. Jesus did not market Christianity for people who want to be comfortable and safe and happy in every regard. Jesus was honest about how he pursued things. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, and Mark chapter 1, verse 17, he said, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. That sounds like labor. Matthew 8, 22, he says, follow me and allow the dead to bury the dead. That sounds like that's going to cost me something, relationally speaking. Matthew 10, 38, he says, uh, those who will not take up their cross and follow me are not worthy of me. That sounds dangerous. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if any wish to come after thee, they must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Matthew 19, verse 28, Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, you have followed me in the regeneration. You're going to judge the nations. That sounds like work and labor, but it's meaningful labor, at least. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, he summoned the crowd of his disciples and said to them, and if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And you hear that phrase, you're like, take up your cross and follow me. And that seems very simple, but in their day and age, they knew what that meant. Take up your cross means get your implement of torture and get ready to die. There was no sugarcoating that. This is not an easy sale. And this is how Jesus pursued things. He was not a good salesman. His sales pitch was, this is going to cost you greatly. You know, like an honest person. The church, though, helps to correct that, don't they? In the church, there are many people who try to soft sell Jesus' message. And maybe you've been the recipient of this in the past where somebody 
told you something about the Christian faith that was somewhat less than what Jesus would say. Uh, the last church I was at, uh, one Sunday afternoon, uh, I was still in the building, and I was down in our offices, and the phone rang. And so I went and picked up the phone, and a uh, guy on the other end said that he wanted to speak to somebody. And in a genial tone, I said, well, uh, good for you. I happen to be a somebody. How can I help you? No laughter on the other end. He said, are you a pastor or a preacher? I said, I'm one of the ministers here. What followed was about 30 minutes of being called every name in the book because he could tell that I was an oily, slick, lying salesman type. He knew that about me just from hearing my voice. He cursed at me. He called me names. Um, most of all, he kept saying, put somebody else on the phone. Put somebody else on the phone. And I'm trying to assure this guy, like, look, man, I, I know you don't know me, but like my, my heart is really in this. I'm not trying to sell you something I don't believe in. I, I'm happy to answer any question or any challenge you've got about Jesus Christ. And he just kept ridiculing and ridiculing and really ridiculing. And it just came to me. Like there are a lot of people who think about me this way simply because of the career I've taken. And it's not without merit. It's not without reason. By the way, that dude got really creepy before all was said and done. He said, could you put a woman on the phone? Could you put a college age female on the phone? I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> um, so those people are out there. But that said, I left that conversation and I thought, man, there are a lot of people out there who really hate me, not knowing anything about me, just because they affiliate me with some version of what they have about the church. Used car salesmen, politicians, ministers, people who promise you something and oversell or people who lie to you or people who take advantage of your emotional state to make you think or do things you don't want to do. That bugs me that people have that idea, but there are many churches that have devoted themselves to exactly that kind of messaging, right? They take advantage of people. They call out things that are not true. They don't preach the gospel message. And here I'll just name names. Uh, Joel Osteen, I think, has done terrible disservice to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you don't know who that guy is, you don't need to find out. Uh, but, but part of what he says week after week is that God loves you exactly the way you are. Uh, you can live your best life now. Christianity is all about getting what God wants for you in your life. And it's me, 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 my, 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 and self-interest and self-interest. And there doesn't seem to be a cost and there doesn't seem to be any sin. There's no bad news. There's nothing but good news. That's not the way Jesus preaches. That's not what Jesus spoke about. There's also a tendency in many churches to try to woo the congregation with manipulative emotional appeals. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, in Christ, one of the guys who's responsible for helping to disciple me, calls them dead puppy stories. Have you ever been in a sermon and that uh, the minister just trots out something that is completely disconnected from the sermon at the end where he tells you some story that makes you very emotional and then does an invitation, right? So that he's just plucking at your heartstrings and trying to get you crying and sappy so that you make some decision. Guys, that is manipulation. That is not right. The gospel of Jesus Christ is too important to engage in false promising or invoking mental distress. Don't get me wrong, I think that making a decision for Jesus Christ is an emotional experience, but it should be emotional because of the choice not emotional in order to manipulate the choice. Does that make sense? Jesus did not soft sell anything. Jesus was not like the church. He wasn't engaged in marketing. And by the way, churches should not be engaged in marketing. If there isn't some bad news to go with the good news, then you haven't heard the good news. Jesus did not soft sell. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. Luke 14. Luke chapter 14, we'll be looking at verse 26 through 32. Jesus says this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoa! Jesus says you've got to be willing to hate every member of your family and even your own life. Is Jesus actually advocating that we hate people, by the way? No, he's love your neighbor, love your enemy. What's he saying here? He's saying, look, take any relationship that you have, and I need you to start looking at it this way. The relationship with me needs to become your number one priority. Count the cost. If you even elevate yourself and your own purposes above me, you're not worthy of me. He then goes on, verse 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. 
So if you're not ready to die for Jesus, can you just show up and be a Christian? No. Is there such a thing as a Christian who's not a disciple? No. If you're going to be a disciple of the Christ, Jesus says, get ready to die. That's the kind of person I need to follow me. Verse 28. For which of you, if he wants to, compl- uh, to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough work to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation, he's unable to finish. All who observe it will begin ridiculing him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what, ki- uh, what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he's strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In other words, before you begin following me, I need you to do this. I need you to stop and go, am I willing to do what he's asking me to do? Am I willing to pay the cost? And Jesus ain't calling his manager. Discipleship. Does it have significance? Yes. You can have a meaningful life. Discipleship. Is it full of hope and assurance? Yes. Is it full of meaningfulness? Yes. Is it a certainty of a kind of security about this life and about eternity? Yes. It's all those things. But more than that, it's also suffering and toil and labor and persecution and temptation. Christianity is at best inconvenient, but it's often serious labor. Does that sound like good news to you? Maybe not yet. Jesus said to his followers, come, leave your boats, leave your careers. I'm going to make you fishers of men. Give away all your wealth. Come follow me. Let the dead bury the dead. People are going to hate you on account of me. You must take up your cross and you must follow me. You'll be handed over to local officials who will have you flogged in the synagogues. He says, I'm calling you to love your enemies. I'm calling you to pray for those who persecute you. I'm calling you to turn the other cheek. I'm I'm going to give you experiences where you will recognize your own failures, your flaws, your frailty, and how weak you are. That's the life I'm calling you to. So why hate Jesus? I just gave you a great reason. Jesus is not a politician. He's not a used car salesman. He says it like it is. If you want to hate Jesus, here's your reason. He's got a difficult plan for your life. If you want to continue hating Jesus, now's the time to leave. If you'd rather hang out for a few minutes, I want to tell you why we should love Jesus for these very same reasons. Let's talk about factors that justify the difficulty. Why do I have to do it this way, God? Why do you want difficulty in my life? Uh, Do any of you have retaining wall block in your yard? You're afraid to raise your hands. Some of you do. Um, This is one of those features, and by the way, if I drive past your house, even not knowing it's your house, and I see that you've done it wrong, I will point it out to my children. I do it every time. See that wall? No foundation. See that wall? No foundation. See that wall? No foundation. Because what people do is they go to Lowe's and like, "Mm, we can do this in our own yard, and they grab that and they bring it home and they throw the blocks down in their yard and what do those blocks look like even though they were completely straight what do they look like after a year freeze and fall and hydrostatic pressure from the soil that's behind and the fact that there is no foundation or tree roots are undermining it the wall starts to buckle and give or tip forward because somebody did not do it the way you're supposed to do it here's how you're supposed to do it crush packing limestone you dig a trench you lay the packing limestone you tamp it in and then you lay up your wall behind it you've also got to put in drainage if you don't put in drainage the water can't get through and will push the the wall forward that's how it's done the right way why because it's the right way jesus when he looks at our life is giving us a list of things that are going to be difficult to do and we tend to look at him and go that's a hassle i can do it easier and it's going to fall apart over and over and over again First reason that we should be thinking about these difficulties as a blessing. Number one, Jesus has been there too. Jesus has been there too. Turn to Mark chapter one as we get ready for this next part of the passage. Jesus has been there too. Do you know what the vanguard is? The vanguard is the part of the army or the military unit that moves in before the rest of the military unit. It is the front. Jesus leads not from the rear. Jesus leads from the vanguard. What Jesus is asking you to do, Jesus himself has done. When I was in high school and college, I, uh, I did kung fu, Thai boxing, um, kickboxing, uh, Muay, Muay Thai, and, uh, and Chin Na, which is a Chinese grappling style. Uh, and the, the studio that I got into, the, the instructor was this old Navy guy who used to beat the fire out of us all the time. The best martial arts studios do. He had an implement he called the ugly stick. It was a staff 
that had boxing gloves on either end and a thin layer of foam wrapped up in tape, and he used to beat the life out of every one of us. My first session in this studio, when I came in, I had long hair back then. I know that's probably funny for you to think about. Uh, he grabbed my hair, and he got me on the plywood floor, and he banged my head into the ground over and over again and went, this is a liability in a fight. I'm like, yes, it is. Uh, I have to agree, sir. Uh, but the worst thing he did for us uh, in this, this studio, he was a construction worker, and he had what he called the wrecking ball. And guess what it was? A wrecking ball. He had an actual wrecking ball in the studio, and we would hang it from the ceiling. It was a 90-pound steel ball, and you hang it from the studio, and you put your back against the cinder block wall, and you take that ball in front of you, and you push it out, and you let it come back and hit you in the gut. Now, we always used to love when people were in the studio for the first day because they would do it, and inevitably they would go, boom, and they'd fall down and couldn't breathe, and we'd all be like, <laughs> and it happened to every, but it happened to every one of us. It was this sort of camaraderie with the whole thing. Um, but here's the thing about it. Mr. Mayor, our Kung Fu instructor, before anybody ever did it, every session, he would get in front of it first, and he would throw it out further than anybody else would, and he'd let it come back and slam it into his gut to show us he could do it. Right? And to, to demonstrate for us, this is what I want you to do. It's called impact training. It's supposed to get your organs used to being hit. By the way, one, one time a dude stepped out of the way when he pushed it out. He was like, nope. And he stepped out of the way, and it broke the center block wall behind it. We were letting that hit us in the gut. Good times. <laughs> Jesus does much the same thing. Um, Jesus is in a situation where he has not called you to do something that he did not first do. When you look at the life of Jesus Christ, you should see that. We talked about this uh, from the John chapter 15 passage earlier, verse 18 through 21. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. No student is greater than the master. Jesus is calling us to do something difficult, but he's demonstrated what it looks like, and he's demonstrated what it leads to. You expect to be treated uh, poorly by the world? If you're a Christian, you should. But more than that, how are you treated by God? Now, this may seem a little odd to you. How did God treat Jesus? That's God the Father treat Jesus, God the Son. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. This is a fascinating pairing of scriptures. Mark chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. This is at the event of Jesus' baptism. John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. He brings him up out of the water. We, we're told that John the Baptist sees the Holy Spirit descending like a dove upon Jesus. And a voice from heaven says this. Let's look at verse 11. A voice came out of heaven. You are me, my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Does God love Jesus? Yes. Look at the next verse. Immediately, the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. To do what? Be tempted. Go into the crucible. I love you. Get into the crucible. Be refined. Be changed. Jesus spends that next 40 days in hunger and in temptation. Why? Because God didn't love him? God's clear about this. I discipline those I love. Difficult things happen in life in part because God is doing something in us and through us. Let me tell you a truth today that I want you to retain for the rest of your lives. I hope this sticks with you forever. God is telling us to do difficult things because Jesus did it, and God's telling us to do difficult things because God is not forging feather dusters. I want you to just remember Captain Feather Sword. God is not forging feather dusters. God is not about building something that is soft and easy and light, a spiritual nothing. That's not what he's trying to make you into. The Christian author said it this way, this is not a world for shallow people with soft character. If any of you have been in the military, you know what boot camp is, right? Everybody in the military has to do it, whether you're a cadet, whether you're somebody coming in from West Point, whether you're somebody who is, uh, who's just signed on, everybody's got to go through boot camp. And is boot camp a gentle experience? No, it is not. Uh, I had a number of students who've gone into the military, and one of my great joys is when they come back and they've got videos. They do videos of people now where you can watch them get the tear gassing. And so they're coming out of this shed with just every orifice in their face like 
<laughs> as much liquids and mucus as you can imagine coming out of a human face is coming out of their face. And it's like, ha ha, that's hilarious. <laughs> Why do they do that? Why do they yell at people? Why are they hurting people? Why are they running? Why are they undergoing punishing labor? Why are they waking up at terrible hours of the night? Why are they engaged in combat training? Is it because they hate their soldiers? <laughs> Some of you have been in the military. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why. Boot camp cannot be hypothetical. Could you sit down in the classroom and be prepared for warfare from learning and hearing lectures like you would be prepared by actually engaging in the difficult work? The answer to that is no. And for many people in the church, when you think about it, many of us have spent our entire Christian lives saying, God, make it soft. God, keep it feathery light. God, I want things to be comfortable and kind, and I don't want to experience any difficulty. God, if you would just keep all pain and suffering at bay, that would be great for me. And the Lord's like, I love you too much. You need to experience a difficult life. God is trying to forge you into something amazing. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 16 and 17 is one of my favorite passages in the Old Testament. It's one that people blow past a lot. It's easy to, you know, Isaiah is an Old Testament prophet. And so he's talking to the people of Israel, but he's talking past the people of Israel using the word of God. He's speaking directly as God from God. So he's a prophet speaking what God says. And part of what he's directing this to is the servants of the Lord. This is what he says in the passage. Listen to this. See, it is I who created the blacksmith, who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. And it is I who have created the destroyer to wreak havoc. No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. God is forging you, and God describes you as a weapon. I'll ask Howard, because he knows Howard, is forging a gentle process? Howard is a blacksmith. Uh, he, knows, he knows what it is to forge. That heat has to be hot. And if the heat is not hot enough, uh, the impurities are not burned away in the metals. And God is doing the same with you. If the heat is not hot enough, the elements do not bond properly. If it is not hammered appropriately, it never gains the correct strength. God is forging human beings. And without the beating, without the difficulty, without those experiences, you never become what God has called you to be. I had a, a friend who was in ministry who described it this way. He said, you know, back when we were in high school, we had shop programs. Some of you don't have that anymore because they got rid of it because of liabilities. But he talked about building cars and about welding. And um, he said uh, they, would, they would be welding up an automobile frame. In the aftermath of welding the automobile frame, they had to call the teacher over. And do you know what the teacher did? Came over with a sledgehammer. And he beat upon that weld. And he beat that thing and beat it and beat it because he said if it's going to break, it should break here. It should not break out there. For many of us, we're in a situation where, again, we are just thinking and saying to God, if we're not even saying it out loud because it sounds terrible, Lord, keep my life as easy as possible. That's not what God wants from you. All the great human beings in history, look through your Old Testament, look through the New Testament, look at the people who've changed the course of history. Did they have easy lives? None of them. None of them. Great people emerged from trial and torment and difficulty. God wants to do the same thing with you, but you have to abide by what he's asking you to do. He's called you to a difficult task. A third reason that uh, I don't think the difficult life should be problematic for us is this. The difficult life is not a bad life. I'll say it again. The difficult life is not a bad life. Think about the alternative. The alternative is a soft, comfortable life. It's where you get what you want, when you want, how you want, according to your nature. By the way, we have creatures on this planet who always and consistently act in accordance with their natures, exactly what they want to do. We call those creatures animals. If you despise Jesus for asking you to make war against your nature, congratulations. You've risen to the stature of a marmot or a baboon. You just want to live how you want to live. 
And yes, you might despise Jesus because he's called you to wage war against yourself, to do things you don't want to do because he's asked you to do them. Paul talks about it this way. He talks about being a slave to the flesh or a slave to the spirit. Uh, Bob Dylan, that, that famed scholar, used to say it this way. You've got to serve somebody, right? So what are you doing with your life? You might think, well, I'm not a slave to anyone. Yes, you are. If you're living according to your nature, you're very much a slave to the flesh. You're just doing what the flesh wants, and that makes you as good as an animal. If by contrast you say to the Lord, hey, you know what? You've called me to some difficult things. I'm going to wage war against my nature, and I'm going to do the hard things in this life. You are being a slave to the Spirit, and that is a good and righteous and godly and rewarding thing. Who's an expert on burdens? God is an expert on burdens. God knows what real burdens are. If, if, I, if I asked you today, hey, hey, I need you to help me out with something, and we took you to the ocean front, and I gave you a bucket and said, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go dip down in the water. You're going to take this water. You're going to walk it 100 yards that way, and you're going to dump it out because we've got to empty this ocean. Does that sound like fulfilling work to you? No, because you know it's what? It's fruitless. There's no point to it. That is not the kind of labor Jesus called us to. Even when we're doing minute bits of toil, even when we're engaging in fighting against the flesh or warring against our nature or waking up early or helping out in small ways through the church or outside of the church or being kind to somebody, even when we're doing those little things, it's not like trying to empty the ocean. What you're doing is you're taking a cut block that someone's handing you and you're taking it to a master builder and you're saying to him, make use of this. And he's building something incredible, even if you can't see it at the time. It is meaningful labor. God is not calling to us to a burden that is without purpose. Psalm 68, verse 19 says it this way. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears our burdens, the God who is our salvation. He is a master of burdens. No one has borne a burden in this world like Jesus Christ. He carried the biggest burden in human history. As it was prophesied in Isaiah 53, surely he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. How many sins do you have? That's a big burden. Not just yours, but the person sitting next to you and the person sitting next to them and every person who ever has or will come to faith in Jesus Christ throughout history, he carried that burden to the cross. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he personally carried our sins in his body, willingly offering himself as on an altar of sacrifice that we might die to sin, becoming immune from the penalty of the power of, the sin, of sin and live for righteousness. For by his wounds, you who believe have been healed. Since sins and burdens are his special out, speciality, speciality, his specialty, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw like 10 extra syllables in that word. Since he loves and values you, perhaps the burden he's calling us to is actually for our best interest. Can I suggest to you that it is? So what's he asking you to bear? Matthew chapter 11, verse 27 through 30. Jesus says this, all things have been handed over to me, my, my father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son will reveal him. Verse 28. Jesus says this, and it is, again, you've memorized this earlier this year, many of you. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. What is a yoke? A yoke is that implement that you put on a beast of burden so it can carry something it is toil it is a symbol of labor take my yoke upon you and learn from me for i am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light did you see the pairing of these two ideas jesus is saying i i've got work for you to do and what are you going to find in the midst of working for me rest what will you find in the midst of bearing the burden jesus has put on you rest some of you are like, that seems counterintuitive. Yeah, it does. But that's the way it works. When you take up his labors and do what he's called you to, you find a sort of fulfillment in this life that you cannot get anywhere else. So what is Jesus' difficult plan for my life? Okay, I'm sold. I want to pay that high cost. What do I do? You might be saying to yourself at this stage of the game, gee, do we have to? Can't it be easy? Can it be posh and comfortable? And the answer is, no, he loves you more than that. No, that is not how an implement of war is forged. No, he will not keep you out of boot camp. He's training you to do things today that you cannot do today, and he'd like for you to do tomorrow, and that requires difficulty and toil today. You remember the show Mission Impossible? Yeah. 
it always, it always starts out with that, uh, you know, your mission, should you choose to accept it? And then the message will self-destruct. Uh, I've always wondered what happens if a person's like, nope, <laughs> not doing that, the end. You know, story over, you know, just run the credits. I think there are many people in our culture and in our world who have heard the cost that Jesus is offering and they just say, no, I'm not accepting the mission. Mission unaccepted, unacceptable not doing it. Now, that makes sense to me for those who are outside of the church, but what astonishes me is how many within the church have heard the message of Jesus Christ, and having heard the message, they go, "Mm, I think I'll settle for partial credit. We'll just show up instead. Guys, there is no partial credit. You can't be a disciple of Jesus Christ and not decide to pursue him, and not listen to the actual mandates that he's given, and not actually engage in those mandates. So what happens if you don't? What happens if you say, I don't accept the mission? Well, Lots of things go undone. And this has been the nature of the church for many years. There are people in your sphere of influence that no one who is a believer knows except for you. And if you're not Jesus Christ to that person, that person might never come to faith. They might never be reached. Um, It always hurt me deeply when I'd been around someone for months and they went, you're a Christian? Oh, man, I've dropped the ball. These difficult tasks going undone, there are kindnesses that remain hidden, there's generosity left unshown. There are people who are never reached. I just want you to imagine a world for a moment. I want you to just visualize this. Imagine a world in which every Christian who lived in this world said, I have a hard work that I'm going to be doing for my God. I have a mission that I'm going to be engaged in. I have a ministry, and this is my ministry. And then they threw themselves into it. Can you imagine if every Christian believer did that? Many people are like, yeah, but I'm here. And shouldn't that just be enough? I mean, shouldn't God be, be pleased that I'm just around? You know, the church talks about, uh, the, the, or God, Jesus talks about the church as a body. Paul talks about the church as a body. Uh, the idea is everybody has a function in the body. Whether you're a kidney or a liver or a toe or a toenail, you've got some part to play. Do you know what call, you call a part of the body that does nothing for the body? Cancer. What are you spiritually speaking? Have you come just to receive and never to give? Is that the goal with the church? If every believer said to the Lord their God, I will do for you, and then took up difficult tasks, if every believer across the world did that, can you imagine how the church would explode? If you don't know what your mission is, let me try to help you to address that. Um, Think about how Christianity is costing you right now. Can you think about things in your life, areas in your life where you're like, I wouldn't do that except for the fact that I'm a Christian. I wouldn't avoid that except for the fact that I'm a Christian. I wouldn't engage in that except for the fact that I'm serving Jesus Christ. If you can't think of anything, you might not be about the difficult task that Jesus called you to. If you don't know what to do, uh, can't think of anything, it's time to try something. Take the initiative. Look around the church. If you have time to complain, by the way, if you're ever an individual who's like, they should do this, guess what? You've got a ministry opportunity. You step up and do it. You be, <laughs> hopefully this does not cause people problems. A lot of people are like, I think I need to be the male singer in the church. I'll get up on stage and you do not want to hear me do that. <laughs> are you the person who's going to love teens no matter what? who's going to be the person who shows up in their lives and has coffee with them or buys them pancakes to talk to them about their lives and help them to serve Jesus Christ? Are you the person who works in the nursery, not because it's your heart's desire, but because this is part of God's difficult plan for your life? Are you the individual who work with preschoolers? And by the way, we were loaded with preschoolers this morning. So quick commercial. If you want to serve Jesus Christ in a difficult way, (laughs) God sees and God knows. Your book of life will be filled with stars. Are you a person who makes a meal to take to those who are suffering? You're the person who sends cars to the shut-ins or goes and shows up and spends time with people in retirement homes. Are you a counselor? Are you a teacher? Are you somebody who cleans or cuts the lawn, who carries out a garbage bag for the church body? Are you that person? Not every role is what one might consider high profile. Not every role is even noticeable. Some of you probably heard me tell this story before. (laughs) William Lane Craig, who's one of my heroes in the faith, he's a brilliant Christian scholar. He was, uh, he was down uh, teaching at a church in, in Texas, and he got invited to the, uh, the pastor's house to meet with the pastor and his wife and the elders and their wives. So he goes to the meal, and they sit down at the table, 
And uh, he looks across the table at the pastor's wife, and he says, now, now, what do you do? And not knowing her. And without missing a beat, she says, I raise the children and seduce the pastor. <laughs> he was like, amazing. Like, he just, he's like, you know what? There, there are people who look at their lives and they go, how will I serve Jesus Christ? And sometimes it's in a support role where you just look at somebody else and you go, how can I take care of that person? Um, I, I often tell my wife this in regard to ministry. If, if I am granted any benefit or I glean anything worthwhile when we get into the kingdom of God, most of that is due to her. Um, the, the people who support and uplift and build up in the church are necessary for what goes on here. And I can say that about my wife today and I'll probably get punched for it later today because she's at home with one of the kids who's sick. God love her. She has enabled so much ministry for me. Do you know what your role is in the kingdom of God? Do you have a mission statement? What is your personal role right now? What is your goal to serve in the kingdom of God? Uh, mission statements, by the way, I think are entertaining because you know, every business has a mission statement, don't they? Do you have one for your life? Can you look at your life and say, I'm the person who, and then fill in the blank. I do this for the cause of Jesus Christ. I've said this to you guys a number of times. I hope some of you have developed that and understand what that is. If not, let me suggest you do this. If you've got your, your, your sheet of paper there in front of you that you're taking notes on, the uh, outline, why don't you go ahead and crumble that up and shove it into your shoe and keep it there for the rest of the week. And every time you're irritated by that stupid lump in your shoe, go, what is my mission? What is my purpose? I hope that you can't sleep. I hope that you're uncomfortable until you get to that point where you say, I am the person who does this for the cause of Jesus Christ. This is the difficult task I am at work in for the kingdom. First ministry I was in, when I got to the building uh, <laughs> that I worked in, I got to the youth room. And in the youth room, they had a mission statement on the wall that was unfinished. The youth ministry had fallen apart before I had gotten there and they had started a mission statement and it was just left undone. And I thought, man, what a beautiful depiction of where most of us are for the cause of Jesus Christ. Like if I don't think about what I'm supposed to do, then I never have to do anything. If I don't know the work that I'm supposed to be about, guess what doesn't get done? The work that I'm supposed to be about. Let me just offer you some more ideas of what to do. Maybe you're the individual who finds lonely people in the congregation and makes sure they're not lonely, but spends time with them. Maybe you're the person who goes out looking for irritating people in the world so that you can saddle up alongside them and become a true friend. How many Christians do you know who would never? Would Jesus? Yeah, he did. Can't look at Peter and not see how irritating that guy was. Do you look for the outcast? Do you become a true friend of that person? Maybe you're not the individual who goes overseas, but can you help to communicate on behalf of the missionaries? Can you offer encouragement to the missionaries? Uh, one of our missionaries has been in Vietnam, and he has been uh, sequestered to his house because of COVID for, I think, like 40 days now? Just alone in an apartment. Can you decorate? Can you decorate for the kingdom of God? Can you plan gatherings? Can you do so for the kingdom of God? Hey, if you have a house and you have some people who are gathering there for the holidays, can you look around and see who doesn't have people and invite them to your home? We're specifically instructed to do that in the New Testament. Maybe you're the old gray-haired guy who looks around and sees people, young men, young married men, and goes, I'll help you install that ceiling fan. Let me show you how to put in an outlet because they didn't have a dad who taught them to do that. Maybe you're a mother who looks at these young women and says, they didn't have the opportunities that I had. I'm going to go show them, teach them, train them, slide my life alongside them, teach them how to rear their kids. What is your ministry? What is the church supposed to be doing? What is your difficult task for the kingdom of God? As we close out today here, let me just suggest a few things to you. Again, I hope I have made life tremendously uncomfortable for some of you. I hope that you leave today and I hope that you walk away and you go, I need to have a ministry in the church. May this be a church that has 100% participation where everybody's giving their all for Jesus Christ. Amen? A couple tepid amens. Because you know what it'll cost. A quick, quick note on works. There might be some of you have been objecting to this whole thing, being, maybe saying like, look, it sounds like Ben's saying that we earn our salvation. Let me assure you, I am not saying that. I am not saying that you earn your salvation. I'm not saying that God is tracking you and like if you fail to make the sale that you're fired. You don't get the steak dinner. 
What I'm saying to you is that God has a plan for you in ministry. Let's look at a quick passage that says exactly this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. We do good works, not for our salvation. You cannot do enough good work to earn your salvation. For by grace you've been saved through faith. This is verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as the result of works, so that no one may boast. Amen and amen. You cannot earn your salvation. But did you see what the next verse says? You will not earn your salvation, but if you have been saved, guess what you should be up to? Working. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. You were created for good works, to do something good for the kingdom of God, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. My friends, my brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus has a difficult plan for your life. And it is the only way you will find fulfillment in this life. And it's the only way you move past being his acquaintance to becoming his coworker and his friend. If you don't have a mission, today's the day to start seeking it out. Find some place to plug in for the kingdom of God. Amen? Let's go to our master in prayer. Lord Jesus, Lord, Lord, Lay before us the difficult plan you have for our lives. I pray that every one of us would snatch it up, that we would join in that adventure, that we would join in the toil and the difficulty, that we could see what you, the master craftsman, will prepare, what you will make of our, our labors. God, again, I pray, we pray for blessings many times. Give us the blessing of discomfort until we have found our place. Father, whatever age bracket people are in, whether they are elderly and on death's door, whether, whether it is a kid who is in this congregation that needs to serve his parents or his household, God, make every one of us, make every one of us see and perceive our need to serve you and your church. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you liked what you saw here, go ahead and click on that like button. And while you're at it, for more great content, go ahead and subscribe to our channel.